Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. And just for the sake of John Bowen, who always has a little OCD moment, good morning True to right. all of our listeners. What if it's the more, this could be like someone waking up to this, you know? What is like their alarm or something? Exactly. The sun comes up, there's a new Beard and Boyo podcast. You stole the title. Welcome back to Beard and the Boyo. For all three of you who are tuning in, maybe it's Chris Stevens, maybe it's James Hatzisavis having a little bit of a moment after recording with us, maybe it's Mike Rhodes doing us a favour by giving us a view and then not actually listening. Mike, get, get off, off Twitch. Twitch. How many times? How many times? Topic of debate, what we've usually done so far on these podcasts is discuss something that's like topical in the relevant sort of thing. We, we thought we'd... Um, We'd, we'd have a little a, a luxury one, a bonus, a bonus cast, a boner cast, um, if mm. you like. Um, so what we're going to do today is discuss, uh, we're going to obviously swing back towards Doctor Who, and we're going to discuss our personal top five episodes of the show. Not necessarily a five to one, um, but very much five episodes that's, oh, I love that episode, I watched that episode as many times as possible, I love it very much. So I think... I think we said we, we sort of I go you go I go you go I go sounds fair and if we've also got like reserve episodes just in case um, I know it is going to happen with one or two of them where I don't know what he's going to talk about exactly and, uh, and I don't know what John's going to talk about it's a mystery all I know is he's got an absolute pad of notes and I've got a page so I'm, uh, he's got an absolute novel over there they're good notes they they, they must be delicious notes um, so would you like to start with one of your oh am I going first aren't yes I? I think right. so. So, a bit of context. So, obviously, we've been watching Doctor Who um, since pretty much since New Who, um, you know, came to our screens. Um, it's one of those where we appreciate everything that came before it, but what we will be discussing today is purely New Who and up, essentially. Mm. Um, so, everything from Christopher Eccles all the way up to Jodie Whittaker. So, Jonathan, we'll start with yourself. Um, Again, in no particular order, okay. what is the first episode from your top five and why not? I would like to talk about Boomtown. You would like to talk about one. Boomtown? Yes. Is, I would not have called yeah. Boomtown. No. So this episode, um, they end up in Cardiff, okay. uh, which is obviously leads to the first mention of the Cardiff Rift that is quite important. Oh yes, of course. Throughout the Russell T. Davis era and also... Uh, Torchwood, of course, it was the whole basis of that show. Yeah. So it's a fairly major episode in that sense. Yeah. Um, they discover that uh, one of the Slitheen from earlier in the series is still alive, and in the space of six months has somehow managed to become the mayor of Cardiff. Yeah. And is building a power station. Yeah. Uh, they discover that the intention is that she's going to blow up the power station and ride some kind of intergalactic surfboard uh, to get off Earth. The extrapolator. The extrapolator. Um, they manage to catch her and stop this plan within roughly the first 20 minutes of a 45 minute episode. Yeah. So the question is, what do you do after that? Because they decide they're going to take her back to her planet. which back to I'm, Coco Yeah, which I wasn't going to say the name of. Okay. Because that is one of the things that I don't like about the Russell T. Davis era what of the Doctor Who. That it, it just goes out of its way to be a bit silly sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, but they can't do that until the next morning because they need to charge the TARDIS up on the rift. Yes. So what do you do in the meantime? Take her up for tea. Apparently you have a meal. Now, um, Doctor Who Series 1, in my opinion, is probably one of the most thematically complete series of it's all time. It's very consistent. It's it? very consistent. Within those 13 episodes, you really feel like everything has kind of been addressed and tied up. Yeah. Um, what we get here, which is built upon a little bit in the following two episodes, is um, examining the consequences of the Doctor's actions. Yes. Um, as I say, the, the production crew probably found themselves in a position where they didn't have much money left for this episode because they'd probably blown it on that massive Dalek fleet that we see in the following two episodes. Absolutely. Um, but what they've done, rather than create a cheap episode they've actually done something incredible, in my opinion, which is taking the opportunity to actually take a step back and look at these characters and who they are and what they've done. I want to go on, a, I want to go on record here and say that I do not like the Slitheen as enemies. Like, they're stupid, the farting thing was never funny. Uh, even when they come out of the suits, which only happens once in this whole episode... They just look horrible. They've got massive baby faces. Yeah, the CGI is very rubbery yeah. at this point. Yeah, I mean, well. you can tell it's just a big rubbery suit. My favourite time of the Slitheen is when they're 
disguised as humans. Yeah. Because it's like you say, you know, it's like, especially after they catch her, mm. she spends a good 10 minutes just like questioning the ethics of the, yeah. of, of all four of them. The whole, like, you know, could you go to dinner with the person you're about to execute and all mm. that. And it is really, you know, the cold stares that they give her back. Yeah. Like they've got no answer to what she has to say. It's an inc- like, we've sort of, we've spent 10 episodes by this point just enjoying these kind of fun adventures with, with the Doctor and, and Rose. Mm-hmm. And at this point, we're actually asked to stop and have a look at, at what they've done, the Doctor, in the sense that, you know, he does just, he does just show up he does things and then he leaves and there's ne- there's never any kind of resolution for him. He just kind of moves no, on. No, no. It's um, up to who, what he leaves behind to pick up the pieces. Yeah. Sort of thing. For Rose, we get the, the wonderful interaction with Mickey, mm-hmm. who basically, he calls her out on what a utter bitch, if you don't mind, she's been all serious. Yeah, well, he says, doesn't he, um, I've started seeing you mm. know, someone and she... she, she she bums out of that. It's like, well, yeah. you've left me sort of thing. So yeah. what am I supposed to do? Exactly. And it's, you know, it, it's, that's a very realistic situation. Yeah. Like, basically, everyone, everyone's been a bit of a dick in this episode, to be honest. Yeah, but, everyone's just um, dicking about. I love how infallible the... Uh, no, uh, not infallible, sorry, the Doctor is presented in this episode. Um, up how in, he is flawed. Yes, up until this point, he's been portrayed as very much a bit of a righteous hero. We had that moment in Dalek where he considered blowing the Dalek's head off, but you could kind of understand where he was coming from in that situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas as here, he is very much called out on what he does. Yeah, um, He's presented as a very vulnerable character in this as well, I feel. Um, whereas in later series, you get um, things like, you know, he's referred to as the Lonely God and things like that. Mm-hmm. In this episode, he... Um, he specifically has the line, don't worship me, I'd be a very bad god. Yeah. Um, which sort of humanises him a bit and it, it just lets us stop and just, you know, gives us that um, gives that moment with the characters. We really believe he could make a mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when we go to the dinner scene and when we have that sort of moment where they're sitting over the table talking and she's calling him out on a lot of stuff, yeah. you, you actually feel like, yeah, okay, maybe she has a point. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't really agree with the fact that she tried to blow up the whole of Cardiff, but... No, but when when you sympathise with the villain, mm. that's just a sign of... That's a testament to great writing. Yeah. Like, when you absolutely... Like, you know, it's almost, it becomes, like, grey rather than black and white. Mm. And you can see the good and the bad in both sides, which yeah. is... You know, that's... Like you were saying, there's some silly moments, but you've got to tip your hats to yeah. the T. Davis in, in these circumstances. And I, phenomenal writing. And I, I do feel that... Maybe this because the, the dinner scene, the risk is that it could obviously get boring. Mm. In fact, I mean, I was about thirteen, maybe, when this episode aired the I first time, right, and yeah. I, I remember walking away thinking, "What have I just watched? That was boring." All they yes. did was they went to dinner. Um, obviously, it's only on on re watches as I've kind of got older that I've realised just what a a pivotal episode this really is. Yes, and obviously, it feeds into kind of later elements throughout the show where we do see kind of weaknesses in the Doctor and we we are called to question what he does. Absolutely. Um, And I do wonder, like, obviously the the dinner scene works. It's it's just got enough stuff happening. Like, we've got bits where she tries to shoot poison darts at him and where she tries to breathe on him. So it it just about never gets gets boring. And Mm -hmm. I... I do wonder how many doctors could have pulled that off. Yes, if I'm honest, like I, I don't think Tennant could have done it. I don't. Think... No, I don't think so. I don't get me wrong. He could, he could switch. Yeah, very easy. But for me, the only one who could have held that scene is maybe Capaldi. Maybe Capaldi. Maybe Smith at a push. At a push. Uh, yeah. Um, but I definitely think Eccleston was the right doctor for that. He's got just that right level of cheekiness. Yes. Mixed with a, a load of morose. A load of I don't give a shit. Yeah. Um, to kind of make that work and not. It's not you don't ever feel like it's kind of serious discussion, little funny moment just to keep everything in line. Yes. It, it all flows very well. Yes, absolutely. Like when he's casually just like stopping the dark. Yeah. But yes, I noticed. I'm still gonna kill you tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, sort of thing. Um the Deus Ex Machina at the end does let down a little bit. With the, um, the TARDIS. The part of the TARDIS just opens. Now obviously and... that was obviously a plot device that had to be introduced. Yes. Because obviously that lays into what comes in a few episodes mm-hmm. of time. Um, so I suppose it was like in the notes of when we're writing this episode, you have to make sure this, mm. this, this, and this is. But it did, it, for this episode story, it is yeah. a bit, like you say, yeah. a bit ex machina. It, it is a bit easy, and it's a shame that it sort of it makes everything a bit easy as to their decision because they're in this impossible scenario where you know they 
they are basically going to take her to be executed and it's a difficult one and all of a sudden it just becomes very easy yes because she's regressed to an egg and i kind of wish uh, yeah i appreciate why we needed the whole bit with the um the tardis nearly becoming the new extrapolator and everything at the end yes. it just gives a little bit of a climax and a little mm-hmm. bit of action um obviously it's a shame that after that they had to go with the egg thing rather than her still being a problem but equally i appreciate it. you've you've got to tie this up in 45 minutes absolutely yeah. you can't be too dark in Doctor Who, you know, no. you, you do have to give give them that way out. So I, I, I'm not a big fan of the end, but I, I just can't argue with how we but got it doesn't, there. it doesn't knock yeah. the journey, if that like it's, enough. Yeah, it's a wonderful journey, even if the view wasn't so great when we got to the top. Yeah. I, I, um, I, I, and that's why I like this episode so that's much. That's why you like that episode yeah. so much. Okay. Have you started with your first episode, like, chronologically speaking? No. Right, so, oh, well... Actually, I have, but that's a coincidence. Okay, well, I'm going to yeah. start with my first episode, chronologically Ooh. speaking. So I, I did have um, one from series one, but it decided I decided it didn't make the cut. Okay. Um, so I'll mention that later. Mm-hmm. Um, but my first episode in my top five ever episodes, I'd like to jump forward in time a couple of series. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's that whole thing about... Um, Infinity War being the most ambitious crossover. Yeah. Um, I'd like oh, you to point no. out, you know exactly where I'm <laughs> yeah. at, I'd like to just say yeah. three words, The Stolen Earth. Okay. Which is one of the most wonderful payoffs mm. to everything that Russell T. Davis had been building towards. Like, you know, at the end of the day, Journey's End kind of like spat in its face a little yeah. bit. Yeah. But I can't ignore how good for me The Stolen Earth mm-hmm. was. Um, right down to just all the elements they brought in all the little payoffs you get if you've watched the Sarah Jane Adventures Torchwood as well as Doctor Who mm-hmm. you know all these characters that you weren't quite you don't, you don't really know and then it's like oh it's Gwen from Torchwood you know and they're mentioning Owen and Tosh and um, you know as well as all that you've got the Daleks front and centre it was just like for me that was arguably as spectacular as Doctor Who got you know you had the mm. Daleks full on invading Earth you saw their saucers flying in planets in the sky you had Rose back Martha Jones back you know Captain Jack and Torchwood back Sarah Jane back you know it was all these it was like almost like Russell T Davis like throwing everything at the mm. kitchen sink because obviously at this point we knew that they were only going to do one more series of specials and then both Russell T Davis and David Tennant were going um, and obviously they did their specials afterwards but for me this was there was an element of Russell T Davis's like Final curtain call yeah. in this in in these in this final two parter, um, I I just felt like he delivered in spades. To be honest, um, it it basically got us to a point where we got to, you know, he's 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 introduced all these characters. Mm-hmm. He's got you know we we know what the stakes are. Yeah. Now he's just sort of let them do their thing, you know. Like we don't need to, you know, nobody needed developing anymore. We just gave us this great plot, mm. and then let them dance yeah if that, like you know i remember i was at yours do you remember that i we, do we were watching yeah. the stolen earth i remember the jaw dropping at the end and, of the and, episode and what what a way to end that episode mm. i mean granted it, it was it was resolved in a very russell t davis in the ne- in the first 30 seconds mm. of the next episode which you know i'm never a fan of those but what an ending yeah to that to that episode you know the doctor regenerating mm. um just fab- fabulous television yeah. um considering at the time you know Doctor Who was pretty much maybe the height of its popularity yeah. at that point. Um, you know, it had the shiny, handsome Doctor, the companions coming out of the wazoo, mm. the Daleks back, and, you know, to have that ending. I remember us all, like, screaming yeah. at the TV. And based on... I'm obviously basing this a lot on my first view experience of it, mm. but just what that achieved in... I think it was still a 45-minute episode. It is just mm. tremendous television. What what were your thoughts on it? I mean, I like I find it very difficult to enjoy the Stone Earth. Is it because, because you know what I coming? know that the yeah. journey's end isn't really a great conclusion. It, no. It's messy. It's rushed. Um, you know, there's elements like you know the way they just kind of bunked Rose off again after yes. we've had like two series building up to her coming back. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some you know there are some great moments in it. Like, yeah. Um, but yeah, I taking Stolen Earth. On its own, I really like. There's a there's a couple of little things that that bug me. Like I mm-hmm. always feel like the the Daleks come into it way too fast. Yeah. There's not that kind of. Whereas with previous Dalek stories, we'd had that very kind of slow build up to them. Mm-hmm. In this one, they're just there. They're in full force. Yeah, I yeah. find it very difficult to get emotional about the Dalek invasion. Yeah, that's fair. Because it's just sort of happened. Well, you, well if you compare it to 
um, the, their build up in Bad Wolf Party. Yeah, away, exactly. Which is obviously a far more sinister build up. Yeah. At the same time, what I appreciated was that these Daleks are like the height of their power Daleks, yeah. and obviously front and center throughout this episode is the build up to the reveal of Davros. Yeah. Which obviously is like the equivalent of like the Joker, yeah, in Batman sort of thing. Yeah. So, and I and I thought his build up was wonderfully done. Mm-hmm. Like you know they 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 made a new score for him, a new soundtrack. It was very sinister. Um, and for those coming back in, obviously I had watched Classic Who, and mm. obviously we were told, oh, there's this villain called Davros coming back. But there's, you know, how wonderful for like some forty year old mm. who's been watching Doctor Who since he was a kid yeah. to suddenly see Davros back. And the in there. continuity of Davros is great. The fact that he has his mechanical arm, which I believe his arm was, was yeah, they got shot him off the last time. Spot on. Yeah, because I was very worried after they changed the Master so much in in Series yes. Three that they were going to do the same thing with Davros and, you know, have him getting legs and being able to walk again just to make it easy but they didn't they did him spot on one of the things I do like about Journey's End is when he recognises Sarah Jane Smith as well yeah yeah it's it's paying respect to that's a beautiful moment and it it does feel like the bit when New Who very much started to feel like a a continuation of, of the old series rather than just a sort of new thing that yeah yeah oh it's hiding behind the time warp yes it acknowledged it yeah um you know, and and even better than that, it tied in old canon to the time war mm. with the whole you know Davros's ship fall, falling into the jaws of this infamous nightmare child yeah. and things like that. So that that's a very good point actually. The whole the acknowledgement of everything that had come before it. Um, so for me, the reason I hold it in so high regard is just because of how bombastic it was. Mm. Like how it they literally you know it's one of those risky moments where you throw everything at the wall and hope yeah. it sticks. This is one of those rare occasions where everything did stick. Mm. Granted, it all fell off quite quickly in Journey's End. Um, and if we were doing a list of top fives, Journey's End might even be in my like top five worst yeah. episodes. Yeah. Just, but part of the reason it would be so high up in maybe a top fives was because of how good yeah. the Stolen Earth was at like, raising all mm. these stakes. It almost feels like it, it set itself up to... Um... It, the, the Stolen Earth was almost too good yeah. and there was no way Journey's End could follow on with that well don't forget Russell T Davis was almost famous for that having these like brilliant yeah. and ultimate episodes that didn't quite pay off in the same yeah. way yeah. in the finale um, and for me this was very much like his absolute this was like mm. vintage T Davis mm. you know like all the characters going back I always think of like Wilf trying to paintball a Dalek yeah you know that's just like that's vintage and there's some Davis, one, there it? are some wonderful like yeah, where he paintballs the Dalek. It's got the whole, my vision is it is not impaired, yeah. which is a lovely throwback to, again, Parting of the Ways, my vision is impaired. he got I shot by Anne Robinson. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, and obviously, yeah. um, you've got Harriet Jones who comes back and they've got the running gag of like, yes, we know who you are. And yeah. The Dalek say it. so it's got, <laughs> the Dalek say it. And, you know, so it's, got, it's like vintage yeah. Russell T. Davis. It's got his silliness, yeah. his spectacular, you know, the, spe- the, the stakes, the silliness. Mm. Everything about what made him a great writer yeah. sprinkled throughout, and in many, and it, it is great, and it, it, it in many ways it just makes Journey's End all the more painful. Yes, because you know that it's been set up so well. Yes, here, you know, I mean, it's like ima- imagine Endgame had flopped. I think we'd have yeah. we'd have the same feeling about Infinity War. Thankfully, it didn't. You know, yes. Endgame was what Journey's End should have been. Yeah, yeah. That, that, uh, that, if only they'd come fine. out in the other order, then like <laughs> T Davis could have taken some inspiration, but. Yeah. Um, that's a, another podcast for another time. That is another podcast for another time. So, Mr. Bowen. Oh, is it me? Bat it back to you. Right. Well, I would like to skip very far into the future oh. here. Um, Jump in your TARDIS. Absolutely. I would like to talk about The Girl Who Died from Series 9. The Girl Who Died. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, by all means... Con- convince me because okay. cause that because that two part of the girl who died and the woman who lived yeah. I, I I hold that as the weakest yeah two parter in series nine so I want to um, obviously the girl who died is a silly episode yes on the surface o- on first viewing I did not like this episode I thought right, it was okay. it was fine but it was just silly it was just light there was there was just nothing to grip me about it yeah um, then I I look back on it and I just noticed. A, a very very subtle running theme. Now, um, I want to talk about religion for a second. Go for um, it. So this is obviously an episode that involves uh, the space Vikings pretending to be uh, pretend to be the the Norse gods. Yes. Um, we get that wonderful moment where 
he appears, um, in, the he appears in the sky and it reminds you of Monty Python and the Holy yeah. Grail. Um, now, despite all pretenses, I actually believe the Doctor is one of the most religious characters on screen. Right. Um, when you think about it, he's a character who, f- you know, very loyally follows a lot of preset rules. Yes. Um, that he doesn't always like, but he knows that there will be devastating consequences if he fails to do that. Yes. Um, so obviously, in this this episode begins with obviously you, you you get that moment where it's sort of like the one thing about gods is they don't show up. Yeah. Um, by the end of the episode, obviously this is the episode where we get the revelation about why he he's got the same face as the guy he met in Pompeii. Of course. Um, by the end of the episode, he's obviously got to this point where he, um, despite everything that's happened and despite the fact that he has the opportunity to save um, a shielder, he's refusing to do it because he. Because he's he's stuck to this set of rules that he's being forced to obey. Yeah. Um, eventually, he chooses to uh, break that. He says, "To hell um, with you." Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's got that very much that moment where he just he just turns around and just decides he's going to do what he wants. Yes. Then we get to the very final scene when he's back in the TARDIS with with Clara, and he says, "You know, he's not sure if he hasn't created a hybrid." And I think anyone who has ever violated their conscience yeah. will be able to relate to him in that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit of a shame that the whole Shielder thing didn't go, didn't end up being a, a particularly strong no, point. I, I mean, I, she's one of my least favourite aspects yeah, of Series 9. I mean, obviously, saving her did eventually result in the death of Clara. So, yes. to be fair, it, it was quite a serious thing and he does reap the consequences like of, before, yeah. of breaking his own rules. But I think it's just... Just like I mean, no other doctor I don't think could have pulled this off. I think it's no. just Capaldi's acting in it is is superb, and and he actually takes what is on the surface a very stupid episode, and just gives it such a kind of dark and kind of there's just this foreboding throughout in his yeah. in his performance that we know he's done something terrible here, yeah. and it's just kind of you know this is going to go somewhere, and I would argue it possibly doesn't in the end, yeah. but. Just taking that episode in and of itself, it, it's it's very well done. Yeah, it's very well done. No, you've you've given me an, uh, inspiration to go back and watch. Yeah, that I episode. Now. Recommend it. As I say, it was for for me. It was the 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 woman who lived, which mm. was like just a real meh. Yeah. Episode. I've decided not to class these as two parters. No, that's I've, fair. I've enough. decided they're not. It's not a two parter, which means no, I no. Take the, this one. Fully in isolation. Out of the two yeah. parters that yeah. ran through series nine, this was like definitely the, the mm. two least connected. Yeah. Um, but I think it's 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 like you say with the whole like stolen Earth journeys and mm. thing. Like I know how meh the character yeah. turns out by the end of it. That um, plus, you know, at, at the time I hadn't seen any Game of Thrones and like mm. I wasn't invested. Neither had in, I. In like, like ooh, Arya Stark. Yeah. So like I was waiting for, to be blown away yeah. by like this incredible tour de force of acting. Mm. It was kind of just like. Well, you've 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 got this actress purely because yeah she's a Game of Thrones. Actress. Well, that's that's it, isn't it? I mean, she's just an actor. In, yeah, yeah, in, yeah. You know, Just because she's in a show that's very popular doesn't mean you know she can do anything. You know, she's no. uh, the character was yeah. fine, yeah, uh, but it, it didn't like wow me. But yeah, and like, that's not a knock at Maisie Williams, by the way. No, I don't think she's not. a very good actor. But you can you know let's remind ourselves what an actor is here. It's someone who reads some someone else's words off a bit of paper and uh, yes, of you know it's not really. I don't think it's really her fault. That, no, of uh, course not. Yeah, um, but thank you very much. That's, That's the thing. That was I'm very good. Was glad very you good enjoyed that. So I'm going to can carry on your theme Ooh. of a doctor questioning himself. Mm. And I'm going to jump forward. Well, we're going to jump back. Okay, back a bit um, to. I sometimes consider this my favourite ever episode. Mm. I don't think it is at the moment. Uh, but it, I look back at this with nothing but affection, and that is the waters of Mars, uh-huh. oh, um, oh, yeah, which is just a stunning piece of television. Mm. Like even ignoring the fact that we're coming to the end of David Tennant's run, mm. we had the whole four knocks thing running through. I just thought, what a great, even just like not Doctor Who, it mm. was a stunning piece of television. Like the acting was phenomenal. Obviously, for those who don't know, it was the the episodes where the Doctor was kind of... He was aware that his time was running short mm. and he was sort of like just visiting places and he wasn't mm-hmm. really, you know, sticking to his morals as much because he was starting to unhinge a little bit. Yeah. Um, and he went to see... Um, well, he, he happened upon Bowie Base 1, uh, which had a fixed point in time yeah. of... The base was always destroyed and it inspired 
uh, Adelaide Brooks's granddaughter, mm -hmm. Adelaide Brooks being the captain of the base, to go out and visit the stars. And it was humanity's mm -hmm. first like reach out into space. So it was always important that those events happened. And the, for me, the, the best moment in this episode is where everything's going to pot. Yeah. And the Doctor is just listening to it all mm. fall apart, knowing that he shouldn't do anything because it's the whole, you know, Time Lord code, you know, don't mess with the fixed points in time and all that. And it's just the lovely moment where he's just walking away from the base mm -hmm. while progressively the characters are getting bumped off by the by the creatures and, you know, things are collapsing around and the shuttle's starting to break apart. Um, just what a lovely piece of television, knowing that if he wanted to, he could turn mm. back and fix everything, but he knows he shouldn't. And it's just a wonderful moment. Um, also a shout out to one of the most effective villains, I think, Doctor Who has ever done mm. in the water concept. And also, it's obviously that amazement where just one drop lands on the guy's nose and he might, you know, he turns. Mm -hmm. Do you think it was just such a powerful moment? But all the work was done in, was 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 bedded in before that to establish just how potent this water was. That one drop did have the impact that obviously Russell T. Davis wanted it to have. Russell T. Davis and Phil Ford, I believe, this was a, a yes. co effort. Yeah. And Phil Ford didn't come back into Doctor Who until Into the Dalek. Right. Um, another episode I very very much like yeah. and also narrowly missed out on my top 10 my yeah. top 5 um, but between the pair of them they've, they've for me they've carved out a masterpiece of mm -hmm. television here and then obviously going back to what you said the our whole theme of like the Doctor breaking his code the Doctor then decides to go back on his word mm -hmm. and basically fight against time I thought it was just a lovely thing about when he went in to try and fix everything and things just started to get even worse and it was the whole time's fighting back sort of yeah. thing which I just thought you know just watching this doctor become so unhinged like you know the whole as the light was about to go out it shone brightest mm. sort of thing I just thought this was a side of David Tennant like the, there was, there's was this moment where they're all like on the floor you know all these, these astronauts are looking up at the doctor and he's like he's, he's trying to use the sonic screwdriver he's using the sonic to pilot the gadget gadget robot thing, oh, which I bloody hated, yeah. to open the TARDIS door, and like he, they look at the Doctor, and he's he's like he's smiling, he's grinning, but it's almost maniacal in what yeah. he's doing. Like you can see him breaking the very idea of what it means to be the Doctor and this code that he stuck to um, for his whole life. I just thought it was like so well done, and then at the end of the episode, um, when Adelaide Brooke is essentially scolding him. But, you know, this the Time Lord Victorious is wrong, I don't care who you are, sort of thing. And then she, this ends with her deciding to kill herself to keep the timeline intact, saying that, she, you know, she wasn't even aware time travel was a mm. thing, but she's, she, so, she's so determined to see her granddaughter succeed, and she's been promised she did, um, as, you've been, as, you know, the Doctor said she would. I think it was just such a ballsy way to yeah. bring her character to an end. So I think this really was arguably T. Davis's darkest episode. Yeah. And I think, wow, what you know, I've seen the entire like the, the entire cheese board of mm. Russell, what Russell T. Davis could do. I've had every piece now. So when it came for him to go, there were no regrets about what he could or couldn't have done. Yeah. Because this was very much, you know, as dark as he could get. Um are, are you a, a, a fan of this? Yeah, I love well? it. Like in fact I'm I'm almost ashamed that I didn't think of it myself when right. I was um but yeah I think when you first start up the episode and you get things like the gadget robot and the, the base under siege and everything, you think, oh, this is just going to be a, a standard filler episode. Maybe we're going to get a bit of a link into the you know, David Tennant's final two-parter at the end. But yeah, uh, but yeah it, just, it just goes in completely the opposite direction yeah. to what you expect. And I think it's, it works beautifully because we knew that the regeneration was coming up and yes. it, it almost felt like the Doctor was a bit of a sort of open book at this point and, yeah. and really anything could happen. There mm -hmm. wasn't the there wasn't the kind of stability that you usually get when you know that ultimately everything's gonna be set back to square one. It's like yeah, and it, it was just so brilliant. And I think having spent three episodes three series of, of the Tenth Doctor being very sort of contained, very morose. But emotionally battered throughout that yeah, time. To see him suddenly break out of that now, mm -hmm. it it, it makes perfect sense for his character yeah. um, you don't doubt it for a second it felt like the, the perfect move the perfect time to do that and the the final moment where he is um, where she's the Ood by the TARDIS where he sees the Ood and he's like have I gone too far yeah sort of you, you you just really feel it and yeah. it, it just gets you more hyped for his final episode absolutely and I think in that moment like that was some of Tennant's like mm. 
he, he was always a stunningly consistent doctor, like with his performance. But I think it was in that moment where he was like, he's he's trying to get back in the TARDIS, and you see him like shuddering. Yeah, like, it was like what such a stunning piece of acting in that moment, and it was like for me when I think of David Tennant, like you know. My, when I look back on his tenure as the Doctor, that's like one of the episodes that sticks out like yeah. the sore thumb is just like, what a great showcase for that Doctor. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you've got people who, what you know, some so many fans like started with Matt Smith. Yeah. And it's like, just look back at this this other Doctor, you know, and if it was like a, or convince me to give David Tennant a go, that is the episode yeah. I would show yeah. them. Because it was just, it had all the charm and charisma that maybe we got a little bit sick of by mm-hmm. the end, but it also had the side that questioned everything it was to be yeah. his doctor and uh, Stan uh, once again I have to applaud Russell yeah. T. Davis for that one no it's a great episode I just feel like these days we just don't get the episodes of that quality anymore no like it, every, like the episodes mm. just they just don't quite feel like they have the meat anymore that, no. that we sort of have back then like this is we've this got is, Doctor Who on a diet these days yeah this is just one episode this is you know, just one one 60 minute episode and it, but there's just so much to it and so much you could talk about and yeah. it just feels like so much love has gone into this and like you say making the water really creepy and uh, you know making sure that it all made sense and the Doctor's actions all kind of worked together obviously we get that wonderful um, knock three times was it three times or four yeah, times yeah knock so it was the whole you know she said it would knock four times yeah four I times I don't hear any knocking do yeah. you yeah and it started you get to the knock. Three knocks. And I was like, three knocks is all you're getting. Yeah. It was just such a moment of, oh gosh, is this the four knocks sort of thing? Yeah. Just the way they teased everything in was just like, yeah. so well done. No, it's really good. Bravo. Bravo. Bravo to the T. Right. Serving it back up to oh, you. Back to me. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of a cheat. A um, cheat. Because there's one specific episode I want to talk about, but it's part of a two parter. Okay. And it's very, very difficult to talk about the first part without going into the second part a little bit. Okay. So I'm going to mostly try and focus on part one, but okay. forgive me if I do branch out into part two as well. Okay, I understand. Um, it's an episode that we've already mentioned um, already today. We're going uh, back in time once more to the very first series finale of Doctor Who, um, Bad Wolf, and okay. to a lesser extent, The Parting of the Ways. Um, as I mentioned, when we were talking... Um, when we were talking Boomtown, I think series Listen to one. Me, he's got this whole essay in his over there. Series one is is possibly the most um, consistent, consistent of, of all the series of, of Who. As I say, it really feels like if there had been no more series after Doctor Who, after Doctor Who series one, I don't think we would have felt anything was there not was a wrapped very up. Finite. Yeah, it definitely felt like it told one consistent story over thirteen episodes. And it, it works perfectly as a standalone mm-hmm. thirteen episodes, yeah. um, and this felt like feels like the perfect way to top it off. Yes. Um, so obviously we we start off with those homages to the game shows that were popular at the time. Yes. Uh, we had the weakest link, which isn't running anymore. Obviously, it's a very like dated episode when you think about all the contemporary stuff. It's a dated episode. It is a da- dated episode, but. You know, I guess yeah. If if we, if you could remake it now, you'd use different game shows. Of course, but yes. E- even in that sense, like obviously at the time, it it was great. I mean, I think I've been watching The Weakest Link just before this episode came yes. on. So you know, we had Big Brother, which is still running, sadly, unfortunately. And uh, we had is that was that, I think the other one, the one that Captain Jack was on. It's called it was like a generic makeover, total show. makeover, or something, something like something that. Like that. Um, and there's it, it it's it's silly. But it's also chilling. I think there's yes. something about watching these programs that where you know that we've all watched, and then just suddenly saying, "Okay, it's basically the same thing." But people die now. People end. die. Yeah. Um, and it's e- it's even even when they they make jokes like you know the the thing that runs the weakest thing is called the Am Droid. Yeah. You know. Um, but it, it's still it's still very creepy. The the music is is phenomenal in this episode. Yeah. Like I don't know if if the Doctor Who music gets enough notice. Really, like in this episode, it's just like the moment after um, the Doctor Jack and Linda escape from prison and they go running up to the top floor, um, believing that Rose has been killed. It's just a, an incredible piece of music. I, know the piece um, I love the uh, music when the Dalek fleet gets revealed as well. I much prefer yeah. it over the one that replaced it in series four. Right, okay. um, I think it's a much more chilling. Oh my goodness, the controller! 
Yeah. Like that is nightmare fuel yeah. right there. And, and her theme. Yeah. Like that, like so. Oh, yeah, oh, thing that was like playing underneath the whole my masters they fear the doctor yeah. the, the close ups it was so well it's done so well done I don't know who that actor was but she is phenomenal in just because we, we never find out who she was like they just no. say she was in she was installed which is a horrible use of language yeah. when she was like five years old or something like we, we don't know who she was we never find that out and then at the end of it she's, she's exterminated she's just killed and so we never yeah we never know like but said. just the, the way she you, you just hear like the the She's almost crying when she talks. It's yeah, just, yeah. Oh, it's so chilling. You, you like the whole, the buying in, you, you buy into the fact that this was a five-year-old girl yeah. who's been like pumped and stuck with tubes and has been told to like just, yeah. you know, control. And why? A, why you know, would anyone do that? We don't know. It never explains it. No, but it's, but it's precisely that we don't know things yeah. that makes it all the more sinister. Yeah. And uh, going back to the games for a second, as I say, I do think there's something very chill. The fact that the point it was sort of make it, what... Because I used to think the games were a, a weird idea. Because mm. why would the Daleks? Because the, Dal- the Daleks were har- harvesting human organs to like make yeah, all the people who were them. killed. In yeah. The they were so I, I always thought to myself, why would they do that? Because I can understand, obviously, maybe when they first escaped, there was like just one ship of maybe two hundred of them. Yeah. But then I still feel like actually two hundred Daleks could probably conquer an unsuspecting Earth quite easily. Yes. Like, why did they need to bother with this whole hiding in the darkness? Yeah. Then why did they go to the trouble to create all these games where you're going to harvest, you know, maybe seven or eight people per game? Yes. And then the only ones you actually get are the losers. Surely yes. it would make more sense, you know, thinking like a Dalek for a second. Surely you'd want the ones that won yeah. because they're probably smarter. They're probably more, you know, on the ball. Why Why are they harvesting the losers? Yeah. Um, but then when I rewatched it in preparation for this, I realised that actually the Daleks didn't create any of that. Yeah. The Daleks just sort of manipulated human development yeah, so that yeah. this is where they went. So you sort of feel actually everything that we see, all the terrible stuff we see in this episode, that's all human. Mm-hmm. Like the Daleks have been whispering a little bit, but basically it's almost as if possibly humanity would have gone that way anyway. Yeah, well, if you think about it, like it's like you were saying, well, I don't want to tread on the next episode, mm. but it's what the Dalek Emperor says, like the diseased, yeah, uh, the, you know, the refugees, they all came to them. So yeah. like, this was just another outlet to get humans. Yeah. And it's the whole, you know, they, they didn't use the smartest humans. They, like, filtered and pumped them and they kept, like, one cell yeah. to grow a Dalek. You know, the one cell of hatred they kept, so to speak, to grow the Daleks. And, you know, it wasn't just mm. the game show, but it's like you say, the Daleks were just prodding yeah. them in their development to basically churn out of yeah. what they did. And the idea of the Daleks just hiding in the darkness waiting to harvest this earth that they had... It's chilling. Presumably been working on for like a good couple of hundred years. Well, you know when, when obviously we went there in uh, the long game, yeah. were yeah. they already there behind I, the scenes? I think so, because he what does say um, this all started with the installing of the Jagrafess. Yes. So, yeah, it's been going on for at least a hundred years, probably longer. Yeah. Um... And how yeah, good was that? You know, yeah. we got that we got the previously to the long game. Yeah, to find that we were then going back. Yeah. to that station again. Like I thought, it was just and it's you know, beautiful. This and... sort of one-off location. But yeah, you know, we're actually going there for this. Finale. I think it would have been so easy to have potentially dumped the Doctor and Co into like a sort of Hunger Games type situation. Yes, but they don't. They choose to go for this game show idea. Yeah, and it, it works so much better. It it's more believable. It's just it, it's chilling as I say when you see all the kind of and the master stroke was that at yeah. the time all these shows were high up in contemporary culture exactly so it probably had a spike in viewership yeah and even just like I mean the ninth doctor Rose and Captain Jack are the perfect TARDIS crew in my opinion they are like solid. all three of them just play off each other so well yeah absolutely even though they don't spend too much time together as a trio in this episode no. like it's I mean just the, like well, like their desire to find each other again yeah. and buy it. Yeah. Like, because they're so well established, yeah. even though Jack's obviously only been, mm. you know, in it for a couple of episodes yeah. at this point. I mean, Captain Jack is wonderful in this episode. Oh, he's a like, do I look like an out of bounds kind of guy? It's it's like the, definitely yeah. the funniest part. Well, are you of hiding the... that and he just pulls the gun? Yeah. yeah. It's just brilliant. Like, and it, it just makes you wish that they bring characters in like that a bit more often. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, it's wonderful. Just to. Um, to go in to touch on the next episode a little bit. Mm-hmm. First of all, I just want to say that the the CGI in that is incredible. In which episode? Uh, in, in well, in both really, but yeah. particularly in Parting of the Ways. Like when you get that 
Dalek fleet flying through space yes. where they come out of the ships and, yeah, and yeah. kind of attack. It's an always an iconic yeah. moment. And I mean, that was the first time that that had been seen. Like, we'd had them going up the stairs for a while. I think that first happened in the 80s. Yes. But this was the first time, as far as I know, that they'd been seen flying through space. Yeah. Uh, the music is incredible. Apparently, the chanting in that music is what is happening in uh, Israeli, I think. That's a, that's, I, I just thought I'd mention that. There's, well, it that's sounds got, great. That's got so no relevance whatsoever. Um, but um, but yeah, um, some of it you can sort of see the green screen. Yeah, of course. Like some of the clock clips of the of the sources of the Dalek sources, well, like does you know yeah get a bit ropey. But mostly it's aged very very well. Yes. Um, and obviously now a lot of people feel that the regeneration at the end is is just far too fast. Um, I kind of like that. I kind of do. Do you mean the whole the way that it's at the end of series one? Yeah. Or like I mean, I I would have loved to have kept Eccleston yeah, for of another couple of series. But it's it's like you were saying, like at this point, you know, that series mm. of Doctor Who has got everything in it. Yeah. And I think having regeneration at the end was the natural yeah. way to end. It's that hard series. to imagine it ending any other way. No. And particularly, like, Eccleston's acting is incredible. Oh, yeah. Like, I love it. It's like, when he, you know, when he breaks out of the Big Brother house, you know, he's got that sort of, when when they say they're going to evict him, he does this sort of fist bump. Yeah, yeah. And, like, it's so brilliant. Like, if... He's there, like, smugly waiting under the thing. Yeah. If if there were behind-the-scenes issues that caused him to quit, it it does not come over in this episode, like, at all. Surely that's just a testament to how good the actor he is. Yeah, he just goes for it, and... His relationship with Rose as well is is just so beautiful. I mean, the the kiss at the end is a bit questionable. It's it's, a bit, it's yeah. quite cheesy. It's quite on the nose. But um, but they actually did it within the realms of the story. It wasn't just let's have them kiss. Yeah, you can sort of get around it. it. Yeah. yeah, but um, you know, as I say, series one is is the most thematically complete of of all Doctor yeah. Who series, in my opinion. And the fact that we've we've put ten episodes. Over ten episodes, they've really built this relationship up between the two of them. Mm-hmm. These episodes, even though you've got you've got Dalek fleets everywhere, you've got robotic and Robinson at its heart. At its heart is, is the relationship between these two characters, yeah. and it even makes the bad wolf Deus Ex Machina very very forgivable. Yes, because it, it just feels so right that that was how the epi- that was how the series ended. Yeah, and the Emperor Dalek is just terrifying. Let's face it, that's one of the most chilling things ever. I think yeah. that's the scariest the Daleks have ever been. Mm, absolutely. Now, obviously, you know, the novelty wears off, you know, so how you, I don't know if how you can make them, mm. how you can outdo those, the way the Daleks were doing that, but for me, there's only been a handful of Dalek episodes after that that have retained a, the same air of mm. quality in them, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's less of a knock against what we've had before and more just an acknowledgement mm. of how good yeah. they were in that story one thing I do want to say I really miss the post time war Daleks um, I think the reason why for me the Daleks aren't as interesting anymore is because they've got too powerful I love in this episode that they sort of have weaknesses that you've got they are crafty little bastards yeah exactly I love this the Cult of Scaro that come in next were an incredible idea yeah, I thought that they were brilliant. really give the Daleks a bit of character Yeah. Um, and then obviously I'm not a massive fan of Stolen Earth Journey's End but I can go with it um, so the victory of the Daleks onwards, because they just get back to full strength, it kind of loses something. Yeah. There's something about the way uh, the Doctor says, obviously, they're... Um, they always seem to find a way. Yeah, he says like they hate their own existence, yeah. uh, and that makes them more dangerous than ever. Yeah. I can't quite explain it, but I think I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something about slightly desperate Daleks that yeah. just makes them all the more scary. Mm-hmm. The, the, the moment they came flying out is like an iconic moment, yeah. even now, look, you know... However many years of new who we've had, that's still up there with like mm. arguably the most iconic Dalek moment. When it cuts to that shot of just the one surveying while the fleet's flying yeah. behind it, it's just a chilling it's moment. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Um, but yeah, is that yeah. is that that's that's that it. your piece? That's, on that's my piece. Yeah, yeah. Tree Mendes. Uh, What's he going to talk about next? Right. Okay. So, from what I've said so far, it's been quite respectable in the whole of the themes and everything i'm now going to be very silly okay and this is an episode that when i say it it's going to make sense that it's in my top five right but to everybody else they're going to go what the hell are you doing oh i know what it's going to be it is called dinosaurs <laughs> on a spaceship <laughs> now let's make it very clear from the off i bloody love dinosaurs and at he one does. point he does he I really want, does i wanted to be a paleontologist yeah. um but every time i watch this episode back mm-hmm. I just have such a laugh. 
Like, yeah. I, I just have such a good time um, mm-hmm. just with how silly it gets. Like, you know, it's not a memorable story or anything like that. It's just, first of all, the addition of uh, Brian Pond. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. I thought he was just an amazing character that they didn't do enough with. Um, but he would, you know, some of the dialogue they gave him was insane. Um, the two robots that were voiced by, you know, Mitchell and Webb from Peep yeah, Show. that's it. Um, even just, you know, Filch coming in and, um, you know, playing a, a you know, it was a forgettable villain, but he was, you know, he he chewed the scenery up where, whenever he was on screen. And I feel like this was just vintage, once once vintage Matt Smith in the sense that, like, obviously he had his serious side, but what he's kind of remembered for is this silly, almost childlike Doctor. I think, like, this script, this episode, this story just gave him what he you know, he was just able to do what he wanted with 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 it, um, and the fact that the dinosaurs were so well done on top of all that, you know, like it helped me buy into the whole thing more. Like, there's one line that I always remember, and that's when they're on the beach, and um, Rory's dad says, "Is that Kestrel?" And Matt Smith, Doctor, and says, "I do hope so." Yeah, it's it just, it just such a, such a yeah. stupid, silly but wonderful moment that just makes me laugh every time I hear mm. it. Um, and the whole, you know, is there any fee- is there any vegetable matter in your pockets, Brian? Just my balls, and it's you know golf balls from the, you know, it's just ridiculous. You yeah. use a golf ball to make a triceratops run <laughs> after it, and it was it's it's all just so stupid. But it's precisely for that reason that whenever it's on, I'm like, yeah, mm. I'm absolutely watching this. It's it's one of the things about Doctor Who is that it's a show that that has the right to do those sorts of episodes. Absolutely, I, not every series could get away with just doing an episode as tremendously fun as that one. Yeah. But Do- Doctor Who can do that. It can it can give us episodes like Bad Wolf, Parting of the Ways, Journey's End, but it can give us dinosaurs on the spaceship. Yeah, and that that's fine. It's under no obligation to to do either of those things every week. No, and I think that's probably what makes it so timeless. To be honest, absolutely. The the fact that it's got so many different strings in the bow. Mm. This week I'm going to fire off a silly. You know, mm. the, you know. Some weeks it's like I'm going to fire this cool bow with dark themes, and this week I'm going to have a bow that's got about three different bends in it and is ridiculous. Um, I'd also like to say that this is the best episode that Chris Chibnall has written for Doctor Who. <laughs> um, which whatever it, happened to him? Um, which obviously, going by what we've said before, isn't saying an awful lot. But um, I just think he's like. Give you know if he's like not in charge of a story arc and he's just given like free range to like dick about and obviously mm-hmm. he had um, Moffat like over his shoulder making sure yeah. his writing was probably decent. Um, I you know I I love what he does with mm-hmm. this episode. It's just so fun and ridiculous. Yeah. And, like there's a moment where um, it's uh, Lestrade from Sherlock and it, oh is he in it? Yeah, he, he's the the gamekeeper that they hunt that. You know, because oh, he brings in a load of like keep I, people from history, doesn't he? I never knew that. Um, and he's, he he starts hitting on Queen Nefertiti. Yeah. He's like, you love a man who's in charge of his big <laughs> weapon, and it's just like so stupid yeah. and silly, and probably a little bit offensive, but <laughs> it just goes for yeah. it. And it's just, you know, I just I love that it just sort of doesn't give a monkey's what anybody thinks. It just says, you know what, we've been a bit serious for a couple of weeks. Yeah. We obviously had Simon and the Daleks. In a few weeks, you had Amy and Rory's departure. Yeah. This was a chance for Doctor Who to be really, really silly. Mm. Um, and, I, and I do look back fondly on those episodes because while there was no real arc between them, mm. they all like had their own genre yeah. identity, which I know was the intention. Which the sometimes start. can be a benefit. Yeah, absolutely. And it, yeah. you know, for me, this is one of those episodes where like it probably wasn't even the best five out of that run in mm. terms of quality of episodes, but it's arguably the most memorable for me just because of how much fun I still have watching it. Yeah. Like I loved Asylum of the Dark when I first Mm. watched it but I feel like so much of my enjoyment was because of the concept of Parliament of the Daleks in the first five minutes mm. once we leave them it's not as, as not as absorbing anymore whereas I've just got a big grin on my face like a six year old to the mm-hmm. entirety of Dinosaurs on a Spaceship obviously there's dino bias as we've already yeah. mentioned but it's just all those elements thrown in and they acknowledge the Silurians mm. and they've got this mad Indian run military system back on Earth it's, it's just all so ridiculous and wonderful and that but that's precisely why I love it. There's only one thing that ever bugs me about dinosaurs dinosaurs on the spaceship and, and that is the way they get rid of Solomon. Yeah. Now I've no issue with the doctor going a bit dark sometimes and yeah, yeah. and doing things that are a bit like, oh wow, I 
didn't expect him to do that. Mm-hmm. I have no issue with that. It just felt like the wrong episode to do it. Yeah, it was like totally a bit of a yeah. If a it had been a swing. darker episode, and if it had possibly gone somewhere in terms it, of the theme, because what it did was it almost mm-hmm. glorified the Doctor killing somebody exactly. in the way that it was like yeah. have your bounty and sent yeah. him off. And, and I, I, I do, I do accept that there probably wasn't any other way of doing it. Yes, but still, it it just felt a bit too jarring. In that episode, if that had been how Asylum of the Daleks ended, I think we'd be yes. talking about what a great ending, what a affecting, unsettling ending that is. Mm-hmm. Because this was meant to be the silly, fun episode, it just felt like the wrong time to do it. Yes. Yeah. Your oh, is it my turn? Is it right? So, I want to jump back in time again. Going back before dinosaurs back before dinosaurs before dinosaurs but after parting of the ways so okay. that should clue you in a little bit as to where we are yeah, now narrow it down narrows i am going to talk about series four midnight oh, <laughs> oh you know what? When, I was, when i was drawing up my list yeah i completely forgot about midnight yeah what a mad episode mm. that was so midnight again was another episode that i didn't like on first viewing i think that was another one we watched together and we both sat there yeah. afterwards like the hell did we just watch yeah because it would you know it's it, it's like you say it's one of those episodes on first viewing that like it doesn't appear to be massively exciting mm. does it but it's what they do with the you know it's what the script yeah. does when you stop and think that it's just so well mm. the, I, the, the floor is yours so. this is yet yeah, another episode that feels like it was intended to be a bit cheaper to yes. kind of you know because again they they had to save up for that massive Dalek fleet that they're going to have in the in the final couple of episodes yeah um but um, again, in many ways, I would argue perhaps Doctor Who is at its best when it's forced to cut back a little bit. Yeah. I mean, the whole episode is basically set within this one um, transporter. Yeah. Um, it, it starts off funny enough. There's amusing music. Uh, yeah. You've got Ten and is obviously a little interaction with Catherine Tate at the beginning. You know, it's all quite jovial. Um you know, we have the bit where they get first get on the ship and he's chatting to everyone and he kind of fiddles with the system so that they can't watch all the entertainment, so they have to... Yeah, so he kills it all because it's all a bit to, yeah, and, yeah, they have to talk to each other and you think, oh, this is a another episode where they're going to get into a bit of trouble and, and everything's going to get sorted out. My yeah. goodness, it turns dark quickly. Absolutely. <laughs> I think there's something quite haunting in that we never see what the creature is. Yes. You know, the closest we get is that guy going, look, you can see it there running. Yeah. And it's like... Just the idea that something could be like barreling towards and they don't know what it is is like yeah. quite ter- terrifying in itself, isn't it? The repeating bit. I mean, obviously, back back in this day, Doctor Who was was huge with uh, with kids, and I think this is yet another fantastic. I bet there were kids like freaking each other out on the playground oh, for God, weeks yeah, after this absolutely. by repeating everyone. It's so creepy. Like I've, I don't think I've ever seen the woman who plays Sky, who's obviously the first woman to get possessed. Yes. I don't think I've seen her. She might have played a, a hospital receptionist in an episode of Bottom, but that's about as yes, far, that's about as far as I think I've seen her in anything else. Yeah. But my goodness, she is creepy in this episode. Well, her performance, you know, the fact yeah. that she had to memorise all that random stuff like yeah. the square root of pi and everything David Tennant was saying, and be like, yeah, direct Dave, directly opposite David Tennant for like long takes copying yeah. each other, and then just the idea that eventually she overtakes yeah. the Doctor. And just the way they do that is just... The way the lighting's on her. Yeah. The way just, when they're like all so well looking done. at each other and he's moving his head side to side and she's following him. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. It's utter, utter nightmare fuel. And one thing that I always... Like, it gets me mad when I watch it, but that's because of how well it's done. Yeah. It's how much you hate everybody else yes in that car by the end of it. Mm. Even the professor that you love at the beginning is telling like your, her, his assistant to shut up. Yeah. You've got... You know, the family who just get really angry. You've got a very young Merlin in mm. there as oh, well, yeah, who's like yeah. a little diva. And then you've got, um, obviously, at the end, that like the, the, the what's his name? The stewardess, like, you know, she sacrifices yeah. herself to take Sky with her. And that, uh, the, the, the bitch of her mum who was there going, it's the doctor, he's the bad guy. Um, she leans in and go, I said it was her. Yeah. I was, oh, I just want to mm. smack you in the chops. It, it's very Lord of the Flies. Yeah. And I think it makes it makes it all the more affecting, I realise, that they're tourists as well. Yeah. And it's a tourist ship. I think had had it been like a military ship or something, it, it wouldn't have been quite as affecting. But these are people These normal people. They're just on holiday. Yeah. This could be us. You know, it's, yeah. it's, how yeah. would they react in a crisis? They reacted how Yeah. As bad as it sounds, that is how slightly touristy silly yeah. people would react. They'd, um, they'd lose their minds. And when they, they finally do turn on the doctor, what I love 
is that all the stuff that they call him out on is the stuff that normally makes him so influencing and so quirky. Yeah. You know, they call him out on how he sort of seems to know everything and, you know, they bring him out on all of that. Obviously, they ask him his name and he kind of refuses to give it and, yeah. and that obviously gets them all very... That Just gets... stumbled in at the last minute. Yeah. You even have a ticket. Exactly. And then it, it even breaks him because yeah. he's battering with all these questions like, why are you in charge? He goes, because I'm yeah. clever. And the whole room oh. stops and they all think, oh, dick yeah so it's that moment where you, they realize you realize that these humble people have like broken him yeah which is just so and it's like it's, it's all the stuff that we think is so cool about the doctor that like we don't know his name he just goes wherever he wants does whatever he wants that's what works against him he gets put through the ring in this episode yeah. and i mean let's face it the doctor practically loses in this episode yeah. like obviously okay he stops the rest of the the people you know, four, four people that he's trying to protect die in this episode yeah he um he There's managed the two pilots, the two pilots, Sky and the stewardess. Yes, um, you know, so he obviously they, he they, doesn't consider that no, a win. He doesn't. You know, it's the stewardess that stops the creature. He yeah. he doesn't solve anything. This this is definitely an episode where the Doctor doesn't come out on top, um, and you really see it. I mean, it it's gone by the next episode, but when he he's talking to Catherine Tate at the end, you can just see how broken, how exhausted he is. And it, it's just one of those episodes, like you say, I think the, the reason that we walk away from it thinking, what the heck did we just watch? That's a testament to how good it is and, yes. and how successful it was. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's just creepy ass. And it's just creepy ass. And the creature isn't even definitively defeated. No, it's that just... That could sort of, still be still out, out there, there as far as we know. Yeah. As um, far as we're concerned, you know, the sky was suckered out. Mm. Her body was obviously burnt by the sunlight. And this entity that possessed her is just... Often, often, yeah, doing its, doing that could that could happen again, you know, because it's don't you say at the end of the episode, like you know, the tours have been shut down, mm. and, you know, the planet's going out of business and stuff like that. So, theoretically, that horrendous creature is still out there somewhere, mm. and that in itself is quite terrifying, you know, it's kind of the whole they didn't stop the evil, mm. which, if anything, makes it a more memorable episode. That's one of the episodes that stands out in series four is like one of the memorable absolutely and I'm not even a huge fan of series four to be honest I feel like Doctor Who was a bit drunk on its own power at this point yeah I agree but I can't argue with that episode no it was absolutely stunning like it's a definite like duel in a slightly shaky uh, I don't know what do duels sit in generally I know what you're trying to say yeah he knows what I'm trying to say I know what I'm trying to say right is it my turn it is your turn right I feel like both of these episodes Mm -hmm. are in our top five Okay. The, like the, my remaining two. Okay. But, I'm, but precisely for that reason, I'm going to back for the one that I think is less likely to be in your top five. Okay. Because I feel like one is almost certainly in your top five. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm going to go for the one that I feel like is, but I'm more confident that it isn't out of the two that I've got. Uh, and so that for that reason, I'm picking uh, Heaven Sent. Um, as when I stop and think about it, I think this might be my favourite ever episode mm. of Doctor Who so the question is is it in your top five or was it considered it's it's definitely considered it wasn't actually one that I was going to talk about but it is it was one of my backups it was number six in my top five right okay yeah um, I don't think I've been quite gripped by a piece of television as Heaven Sent mm. did Heaven Sent did more than was more than a Doctor Who episode for me like he just completely surrendered to Peter Capaldi for 45, 50 minutes, mm. considering the episode is pretty much just him. Mm. But, because I remember like finding out about this episode early in the run and thinking, oh, it's going to be a quirky episode, you know, like a companion light or a Doctor mm. Light thing. Oh, it's going to be one of those. Then I found out it was like the penultimate episode of the series. I thought, bloody hell, they're, they're taking a risk here. Yeah. But, what a risk. It paid off absolutely in, in space. Incredible. Um, the one thing that I think I hold against it which I wasn't victim of but so many people knew that Mm. Gallifrey was coming at the end of this episode I didn't I think I remember I was told and I went around telling you and Mike Mm -hmm. don't read any synopsis apparently it's like a massive they drop massive spoilers Mm. Um, and it turns out they did and I feel like that's something Doctor Who is really guilty of Mm. Uh, but that's another rant for another time Um, but what an icing on the cake to what was already a stunning episode. Mm. Oh yeah. To have that it was all in his confession dial, mm. and at the end of it, you know, it, it turns out he, he he was coming out on Gallifrey, and this is all a plot from the Time Lords. So, you know, the concept being that he just lost Clara, 
he had been locked away in this prison he was emotionally scarred um, and then you know he was trapped in this castle with this it was called the veil the veil yeah. was, was, was the entity that was such a really chilling villain that was basically de- devised of this dead body that he saw as a kid <laughs> yeah. covered in flies um, and everything was like there to torture him mm-hmm. um, and I just I thought it was just so effective as an episode like just the concept alone was amazing and then obviously you had the director Rachel Talele I think her name is who's like directed a lot of Peace Capaldi's finale who's a stunning director I love her um, and obviously Murray Gold's score like he made some music that I think we've only ever heard in this episode that's like among his best pieces mm-hmm. of work and obviously you know I think it's it's no small statement to say that Capaldi's probably our favourite Doctor yeah. from, from New Who um, absolutely and I feel like this is one of his episodes that is like it's up there with his yeah. very best I mean it's his episode isn't yeah, it yeah he He's carries the practically the only thing. actor in it yeah um, um, I just think everything they do you know right down to his performance the writing the, the atmosphere the mm. direction the music everything was spot on and the twist at the end because yeah. I remember finding his clothes on the on the because he comes in doesn't he soaking wet yeah and finds his clothes on the dryer I thought this is really weird I yeah mean, but because I was so immersed in the episode, mm. it didn't allow like my, my the another side of me to think, okay, yeah. what does this mean? Because I was so immersed, yeah. it just all clicks perfectly so into place. When, doesn't it? when the episode wants it to click, yeah, it clicks for you. Mm. I just thought it was so well done, and obviously, it. it what, what I find mad is the the resolution isn't that he finds a way to defeat the evil. Mm. It's just that over billions of years, oh, that just wrecks head. That yeah, does. And the fact that you get all that information yeah. in about two or three minutes of editing yeah you know you know, we cut to the same shot of him standing at the top of that tower going yeah. 12,000 years 200,000 oh. years nearly a million years nearly a billion years it's like how long has yeah. he been punching that wall for yeah you know it was just so good the only thing that bothers me is that he when he gets out of the confession dial he suddenly seems to remember that he's been in there for billions of years like I don't quite get that Right, so when, I suppose like, it's one of those things that like he realizes it. Yeah, it's like considering it's supposed to be each is basically a different version of him, and that doctor actually does die. Yeah, and then they obviously a clone basically comes out of the teleport. That irked me slightly, but not enough to to not enjoy to the episode and ones. not just love yeah. love it. It's so creepy as well. Yeah. I think it was just like we remember series nine as like. You know, like this ultimate fan service that yeah. was like so not drunk on its power, but so mm. confident in what it yeah. did that it was like happy to take risks. Mm. And I think this was like the biggest risk, but it was the biggest reward yeah. that we got from Series Nine. I mean, I do feel like Doctor Who was in a a position at this point where it, it wasn't didn't really seem to be batting for new fans. No, it's it was it was a unique position Doctor mm. Who was in. I think that's the thing that Stephen Moffat's been quietly doing. Yeah. Not so much trying to bring in a casual audience, mm. but have an established fan base. Yeah. So it was rewarding people who were clued up yeah. with Doctor Who. And I understand why it can't always be like that, and I understand why we do have to keep going. Yeah, Doctor back Who has to be more than that. And trying to get new fans in. But I'm just so glad that we got what this we did, moment. Yeah. And I think my goodness yeah know. what a moment yeah what a payoff as well because obviously it wasn't just um it wasn't just a tremendous episode but it was also a payoff to something that's been established since doctor who came back to our yeah. screens with gallifrey returning mm. and what a payoff that was yeah. you know go to the city find someone important tell them i'm back yeah oh <laughs> man what, yeah. what a moment and it opens up so many story possibilities as well. Like, I mean, Gallifrey has been underused ever since that episode. Oh, criminally so. In yeah. the sense that it's just not really been used. But um, just having it out there is just a wonderful prospect to Absolutely. kind of think about. And it's all because of this episode that, that we can do that. Absolutely. Now, if Jodie Whittaker's Doctor could just say Gallifrey, that'd be great. But yeah. that mm. is a rant for another time. Yes. We've had that rant. We have had that rant. Um, on YouTube. Check it out. On YouTube. Check it out. Shameless um, plugging. Yeah. Um, right, okay, so that is why I love Heaven Sent. I feel yeah. like Hellbent wasn't quite as good. I don't no. think it deserves the hate it gets. I didn't even know it got it, hate. It, it does get oh, a lot okay. of like yeah. lambasting. Oh, okay. Um, but I I really love... Yeah, I, like, both, I wish both, they'd both made it a Gallifrey of. episode rather than... Like, you know, I think episode, it was one yeah. of those, like, I enjoyed it at the time. I look back and think, oh yeah, they could have done this, they could have done that. Yeah. But look, like trying to watch... It's one of those like it's is it a two parter? Is it really a two parter? Because Heaven Sent on its own yeah. is like such an immersive piece of media that mm. you know I have to stand up and like applaud it 
because of how good it is. Like it's got my favourite Doctor, everyone firing on full cylinders. Yeah. Outstanding. Can't fault it. Credit to everybody involved. Mm-hmm. Me, fi- the, my, so th- this is your final. This is my final episode. Your final episode. So I want to talk about an episode that um, you. When I first say it, you'll probably think that's quite an obvious choice. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder it's if it's a, the one that I think it might be on because it's a, it's a special episode, uh-huh. um, and it's. You, yeah, but I hope I'm I'm picking on it for reasons that aren't immediately obvious. Mm-hmm. Um, it is, of course, Day of the Doctor. Absolutely. <laughs> he knew it, he knew yeah, it. It's, it's yeah. the last one on my list as well. Now, there's plenty that bothers me about Day of the Doctor. Mm-hmm. Um, for starters, as wonderful as John Hurt is, why was Paul McGann not the War Doctor? Yeah. Um, why on earth was Billy Piper playing the moment instead of a companion that the War Doctor would actually have recognised? Yeah. Um, I don't like the way the Zygon plot gets dropped part way through. Yeah, it just feel it almost feels like there's sort of two episodes playing off each other. Yes. Um, but the the main thing that I love about this episode, if you had told me right up until because we we went to see it in the in the cinema, um, I think even right up until maybe it even happens in the episode, if you had told me that they were going to bring Gallifrey back. I would have told you, no, for goodness sake, don't do it. You'll just retcon everything that's happened since 2005. It'll just cheapen everything. Yeah. But they do it, and my goodness, somehow it works. Yeah. Somehow you can buy the way it comes back, in very much the same way as as I was, in my mind, practically begging Marvel not to go down the time travel route for Endgame. Yeah. We we seem to mention Endgame a lot in these podcasts. We we should probably we should probably do a podcast on it sometime. Probably. Um, But in the same way as I was begging them not to go down the time travel route, and they did, and it actually worked. This is very much the same emotion. Yes. They managed to. They Gallifrey doesn't get resurrected. It doesn't come back from the dead. Um, They don't undo anything that's happened. They just sort of. It just didn't quite happen the way we thought it had happened. And most importantly, it doesn't. It, it doesn't like discontinue everything that's come before no, it. No, absolutely that you, you not. Know, that very important scene where John Hurt says, "I won't remember this, will I? Mm. I'll still remember that I tried to burn Gallifrey yeah. and save it." So you've still got mm. all that character development up to that point that hasn't just been thrown out the window by yeah. this really ballsy decision. Yeah, and it's it's amazing. I, honestly, I can't think. Obviously, it, it, it's sort of a shame that the 50th anniversary war almost sort of felt like a celebration of new Who as opposed to old Who. Yeah. I understand why Moffat didn't want to bring any old Doctors back. You yes. know, that's why he did the Five-ish Doctors reboot. Um, yeah, that mm-hmm. was kind of his tribute within the episode. He said, "I don't want." He sort of said the reason he didn't do it was because he didn't want them trying to mimic something they'd done 30 years ago. Yes, um, which is I completely respect. But um, honestly, I just can't think of any better way to to kind of create this fan pleasing episode than something as big a twist as that. Yes, it's it's and it never feels like it's jumping the shark. It never feels like it's going too far. No. It just feels like all you've done is is open up these wonderful possibilities for stories for effectively the next fifty years, perhaps. Yeah. Um, there's also just some some great moments in it. I mean, I've, I've said that the Zygon plot and the Gallifrey plot feel like two different plots, but they, they connect up just enough. Yes. Like, I, I enjoy how... The whole cup of soup concept. Yeah, and I, those. obviously, when the three Doctors try to, obviously, stop Kate Stewart from setting off that bomb, and, you know, 10 and 11 are sort of like, what, refer to the time war, and they sort of they say... say what this I, is never a decision you'll be able to Yeah, make what I did that day was wrong. The, the themes kind of carry on. Absolutely. So I, I'm okay with that. I... Um, and I, I also love the interaction between the three Doctors as well. Like it, oh, it, it works so wonderfully well. Yeah. You just know that like Moffat's been waiting almost his entire yeah. life to write a script like that. Yeah, with such you know, it is like a downscaled Avengers. You know, all yeah. these well-established characters on their own mm. clashing is just yeah. so wonderful to see. It's um, it's great, and just the the hilarious like the whole timey wimey thing. Where I have no idea when it picks <laughs> this up. And all, it's br- and all it's that. brilliant. I, I think my yeah. favorite line is. Why are you pointing your screwdrivers like again with the pointers? What are you going to do? Assemble a cabinet at him? <laughs> yeah. And it's just, it was just like watching John Hurt call out, mm. you know, these 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 younger doctors was just incredible, and especially just also like, am I having a midlife crisis? And, yeah. <laughs> you know, just 
you know, the fact that Doctor Who was so confident to take the Mickey out of itself, mm. and he even got knob jokes in there. Yeah, you know, with, you know, comparing this on its screwdriver, yeah. and he says, "Compensating for what? Regeneration? It's a lottery." You know, if you stop mm. and think about that, it's basically doctors comparing knob sizes. I thought that's just like how ballsy is that? Yeah. Um, but I, th- I think what because this was obviously on my list as well. Mm-hmm. The reason it's on my list, like I can sit here and try and tell you all these reasons why I love it which are probably the same reasons why a lot of people love it mm. but it's just the fact that we came out of that episode on such a high yeah and it was such a unique situation where mm. we sat in a cinema with all of the nerds yeah and just experienced it together like that's up there with like Endgame for like a nerdy mm. experience there it is again and there it is again <laughs> um, just all these people going nuts over the same thing like how loud did that cinema scream when like Peter Capaldi's yeah. face appeared? Yeah. Oh my goodness, those eyebrows. You know, no sir, all 13. Yeah. And his face appeared. <sighs> like, it was just, what a moment. that I remember mm. you like, like almost bringing into applause. Yeah. We were all just like losing our minds. And you know, just all the little things, like obviously Tom Baker's cameo at the end. Mm. That on yeah. its own would have been a lovely way to celebrate 50 years of Doctor Who. You know, everything they did, you can tell they just worked so hard to get it right. And even though... I agree that it should have been Paul McGann play the War Doctor. Mm. I think John Hurt was still a wonderful. Oh, I can't addition. argue. No, I can't like, argue with John Hurt. Like at all. his performance and what he did. Like he's up, he is just as much a Doctor mm. as any other yeah. incarnation. We've no, had. don't get me wrong. I can't argue. I, I'm not sad that they cast John Hurt at all. No, what what a um, wonderful wonderful portrayal and you can tell how much he's like just mm. done with everything and how much it scars him. And to just have an actor of the fame of John, John Hurt Hurt's playing Ilk the Doctor, Doctor Who, Who yeah. playing Do- the Doctor, you know. It, it, what an amazing thing. That that's, not, that's not to be sniffed at. Absolutely not. This, that's like a, an actor with a massive pedigree. Mm. To have him as, like, you know, one of our heroes is yeah. an amazing moment. I also can't argue that shot of all 13 Doctors at the end as well. Absolutely. Like, that's, that's, that's a it's fantastic so way to end it. Moments. Yeah. And, like, yeah. it's one of those things that I think, like, obviously a load of people watched it, but, and it, you know, it was all, okay, we've got an opportunity to, like, branch out here mm. but most importantly it was a love letter to the fans yeah you know at its heart was okay let's give the fans something incredible you know re- resurrecting Gallifrey mm. go let having us just see the time war I mean that was like, just amazing in that itself that first bit when you you sort of see the time war and it kind of goes past the Dalek fleet like zooms into Gallifrey oh, it's amazing isn't yeah it? I mean that's that still gives me chills like the bit where, it, where it now. we see the painting mm. and he's like I was there yeah and it flies through the painting yeah and, saying, and he would commit a crime that would silence the universe it was, it was so yeah. good like you've Obviously, we said like Doctor Who knows how to be silly and stuff. Mm. Doctor Who knows how to be badass as yeah. well. That was one of those moments where we know how ridiculous yeah. badass we're going to be, but we're going to go for it and anyway. It's such a touching moment when Ten and Eleven show up in the barn with the War Doctor. Oh, so sweet! And just the, the way Eleven says, "You were the Doctor on the day when it was impossible to get it right." It's just so sweet. It's like there's wisdom in that, like because sometimes in life it is impossible to get it right. Yeah, it mostly happens on roundabouts on the A55. Absolutely, but. Um, yeah, and it's just such a kind of touching moment between between these characters. Yeah, um, and the whole yeah. thing, you know, the, you know, the sound of the TARDIS brings hope. To yeah, it, and that we just we focus pull to his ear as the TARDIS comes in. It, like you know, it just the, the 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 slightest response from John Hurt's performance, but you bore every little moment. Mm. Like what a sweet moment it was, and just the touching moment of. But this time you don't have to do it alone, and they were yeah. all theoretically about to destroy Gallifrey. <sighs> It's. Um, it was just a testament to everybody involved. Like that's almost a podcast in itself. How good yeah. was the day of the Doctor? I, I also love how they've very cleverly done something because obviously when when Tennant was the Doctor, it was it was very time war focused, and there were, mm. there were a lot of references to that. Obviously, when Smith took over, they they went down. They decreased he a little bit. It, but yeah, and it, which I feel was probably just a decision that like, okay, the audience are probably getting a bit sick of hearing about this now. But they work it out so well in this, where they kind of, you know, the man who forgets and the man, man who regrets. regrets. Yeah. As like, as I can almost believe they planned it that way. Yeah. I don't think they did, but it, yeah, when, it's when, beautifully when, done. When, when Billy Piper's there, says the man who, the man who regrets and the man mm. who forgets, and it's like, gosh, yeah, it's so yeah. good. And it, and for me, the the greatest line is, um, you know, you are the Doctor. No, great men are forged in fire. Yeah. 
it's a privilege it's the privilege of lesser men to light the flame what what a line that is yeah. it almost feels like Moffat like wrote like lines that he didn't have the context to and like fed, him, <laughs> fed his way <laughs> just like, looking for ways to just include just find it. a way like a yeah. road map of how to get like that's how good that line was yeah. like you feel like he, he almost started the ep- like that's almost the line of his character you just accidentally turned yeah. on the TV yeah I'm trying to turn it off now you're a silly boy there you go I sat on it I'm just sat on it got too excited but I I thought like akin to Heaven Sent it was just everybody firing on all cylinders yeah. and especially considering you know Chris Brackelson didn't want to come back mm. what they did what they did with what they what they achieved with what they did was just so good mm. and all you know all the little things that built up to it you know the night of the Doctor with Paul McGann what a wonderful surprise that was imagine that being the opening to the day of the Doctor yeah like you yeah. know the levels and stuff but uh, I just think that whole thing was just handled really well what a mm. perfect anniversary it was I just remember afterwards because we were with a couple of others and we said goodbye to them and I just put my hand on your shoulder and went oh yeah. right in front of some of the guys <laughs> and looked at us like we were just having a moment yeah. like no episode of Doctor Who has ever made me feel like that no and, and very few pieces of nerdy brilliance have made me feel like that mm. nor do I ever think they'll make me feel like that again and it's just a, if anything it's just I look back on the day of the Doctor just because of how wonderful it made me feel in that moment mm. um, and you know if I was to argue the case it probably is my favourite ever episode it's a yeah. special episode it should it should almost Definitely. not be considered yeah, an episode it feels unfair doesn't it, it in some ways but whatever but, but screw it it still yeah. is just that good mm. so what what else was in your top ten okay oh, I'm don't, of... don't give them any uh well, we don't have time to give them, you know, their own little. Segment, I'm, I'm but... kind of reluctant because there's there's one that I think will really raise some eyebrows, um, but because I and now I'm not going to be able to explain why it's on You're there. Look like a lunatic. Yeah. So uh, number six was Heaven Sent. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kill the Moon. Kill the Moon from oh, series uh, series eight. Love, uh, Love and Monsters from oh series my two. Gosh. There were reasons for that which I would have gone into, but I'm not going to anymore. I'm going to assess a separate podcast called In Defence of Love and Monsters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Listen from series also Another from series eight choice. and Oxygen from series ten. Oh, that's a good shout as well. Lot of Capaldi's. Lot of Capaldi's. Uh, the episodes that did not make the cut were Father's Day. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Blink. Mmm. Um, the Eleventh Hour. Yeah. Um, Into the Dalek. Mm-hmm. And Flatline. Yeah, no, I've got, Flatline's a bit of a surprising one, but the other four I can definitely get on. I, I don't not like Flatline, but it's stretch of the imagination. I just wouldn't say it stands out for me. No. But, yeah, no, I can't argue with what that. What we've noticed is a lot of our backup choices in our, in our top ten were a lot of Capaldi episodes. Yeah. It's just outlined to me how consistently brilliant Capaldi's yeah. run was. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the, you know, with the love of monsters, I can't wait to have a good chat about that, because that's... Uh, I need you. I need yeah. you to justify Peter Kane in a green rubber suit. I'll read you my notes sometime. Tastes like chicken. Yeah, um, yeah. But yes, um, I think we've reached a natural conclusion. Yeah, that was us. You were you, and thank you for that. Stay beautiful. Hope your cup of tea isn't too cold, Mike. Get off, get off Twitch. Twitch. <laughs> um, this has been Beard and the Boyo. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I'm going to do a very cheesy thing now. Put your favourite episodes in the comments. Tell yes. us what it is you Actually love. do that. Yeah, we can have debates and stuff. Yeah, we might actually reply. I if, know. If we're not busy. But yes, thank you very much for listening. We will see you next time. Bye. Beard and the Boy was recorded in front of a live empty space. Starring Jake Saunders and John Bowie. Also, Mike, get off Twitch. Also, Mike, get off Twitch. 